let us let me begin. Uh, anybody got a chance to look at total number number of aspects in language, in natural language? No. I mean all the languages that we speak is natural language. Answer my question. Have you looked at that? Yes, sir. Yes. So, then tell me. Uh, I, like, I ch uh, checked the, just the Wikipedia page. Uh, uh, like, it, it was not very, con the arguments were not very convenient. Uh, like, uh, in, in English, they have identified, uh, like, for four uh, aspects in, the f uh, for two tenses, uh, past and present tense. What are they? Uh, simple present, present progressive, present perfect, and present perfect progressive for present tense, and the same for, uh, for the past. Sure. See, aspect is the reason why I want you to look at that part. The primary thing for you to understand is aspect is something different from tense. That's number one. In the sense that aspects adds, aspects add something else to sentence. Tense tells us about time of the action. Aspect talks about more particular, particular uh, manner in which uh, action was done at a particular point in time. That's the that's the reason why these two two things are different. Now, when we say simple or continuous or perfect or what was the fourth one you said? Perfect, progressive. The all we need to know, there are, there are terminological differences in that. What we say progressive is exactly what is continuous. The, we, we just need to understand uh, this, uh, the, the differences between these two terms. However, we also need to look at examples of what we mean when we say perfect continuous. Okay? Uh, I am planning for little bit more discussion on that. Uh, at, at some other time. So, I give you some more time to look, to, to look at that uh, particular uh, aspect of aspects. Uh, let us move ahead with uh, what, what we have to discuss. So, we were looking at this structure of sentence yesterday and we, we now know that uh, we, we, now, we now understand about endocentricity of a phrase that is a if we are talking about an NP, then only nouns are going to be head of that phrase. When we look at uh, smaller sentences, straightforward, nice looking sentences, this is what I, I have mentioned probably several times, nice looking sentences. This is what I mean by well behaved, nice looking sentences, where you have a clear verb, clear subject and a clear predicate and two parts of predicate that is a verb and its complement. That, that is what we mean by nice looking sub sentences. Sentences are called inflectional phrases, that is because what heads is, what heads is, uh, what hosts a sentence and the head of the sentence is not a lexical word, either subject or the verb. The head of the sentence or what plays the most significant role in a sentence is inflection. Right now, we are considering inflection as the bundle of features, which is both tense and aspect together. Uh, and then we know that sentences must have a subject, which is outside of the predicate. It naturally follows from that, that the sentences must have predicates too. In the absence of either one of the two, we do not have a sentence. Verbs, however, may have or may not have their complements. Any sentence, yes. And um, like yesterday, we saw a sentence within a sentence. Right. So is the, I mean, is the smaller sentence also an inflection yeah. phrase? Also an inflection and phrase. And the bigger sentence. Yes. The only thing we need to know is how do we, how do they get represented in X bar scheme? Should not be very difficult. It's 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 a logical thing to look at to to. Uh, X bar itself is a, is a logically designed mechanism uh, uh, where you remember about the categorical rules. The verb no subcategorizes for the whole sentence. So where is the where is the second sentence going to going to be? 
should not be difficult for us to understand, right? That is, if if the second sentence, like in the sentence number two on the screen, if this if the S two is subcategorized by the verb no, then we know it's the complement of that verb, and then this sentence is going to be exactly in the same place where complements occur. And then we go ahead with the another sentence. So, here, here is how it works. Any, any question about sentence number 1? No questions about sentence number 1 here? That is the first sentence? Okay. Let us let's look at 2. It is a sentence which is an IP, it follows all its endocentricity and other components of a phrase and then we have here I as its head and then we have a VB as the complement of this head where we have a subject NP here where, what is the subject here? John and then this, the structure of the VP is again this is where we have no. This is the main sentence. Do we, do we understand uh, that this sentence John knows that Bill loves Mary? Is this one sentence or two separate sentences? Is this one sentence or two separate sentences? Connected by that. John knows will be an incomplete. Will be incomplete. Very true. It cannot be two sentences. There is a sentence in it which by itself is an in, could be an independent sentence, like Bill loves Mary. By itself, that could be an independent sentence. But when we are talking about this whole sentence, this whole thing is one sentence. And the second sentence that you see is part of the first one in the sense that that is the part of the, that is the part of the verb which is, that is part of the predicate no. In, in the sense that this S2 is complement of the verb no. Get it? The, the, by nature, this predicate can take an NP as its complement or it can take more than an NP which could be an IP. Please know, I am going to change this thing in a, in, a, in a few moments, but right now I am going to put another IP here. Why I, will, why I will change this to anything else, I will discuss that with you too. So, now you know that we have John knows and then this S2 comes here. You can draw the structure of this IP again and I leave it for you to draw this. Okay? So, again the subject of this IP is going to be what? We will have a subject here and the subject of the second sentence what you see on the screen is going to come here. And then it, it has its own tense and then it has its own VP and that VP has its own verb and the complement of that verb. So, where does that come? Into this is why I said I am going to change that in a moment. I'm coming to that. No, no, which, which means, and it is it's a good, good thing that you are asking, it simply means that we cannot ignore a single component in the sentence because every, every part of a sentence has consequence for uh, its presence and that refers to something. Uh, so, I am coming to that. But for the, for the time being, what I want you to know is how the, how the predicate no takes a whole IP, a whole sentence as its complement and then it stays in such a place that it is non-recursive structure, it stays here and then it works as an independent sentence. Clear? Okay. Since we are working on this, what comes here? in 
the head of this main sentence? What is the tense of the main sentence? Present. Present. So, we will settle down with this much for the time being and uh, we, we are not working on the role of aspect in this sentence right now. If there is any, we put this as bundle here, bundle of features. Uh, this is really truly a part of advanced syntax thing where splitting these things and their consequences have been worked out. But, but I am I am not saying that you are, it is difficult for you to understand that. So, all I am saying is a discussion on this does not have too serious a consequence on trying to understand what we are doing right now. All right? Okay. Now, uh, so this is how this structure works. The question is, what is that doing in this sentence? Moving, it, it connects. Is it really only connecting or is it doing something else? What is the meaning of this that in this sentence? Really? Or is it is it little bit different from conjunction? See, the reason why I am raising this question really is when we have, when we use actual conjunct words, that, that is why I asked you, this. are there two separate sentences? Yes, so, we cannot do a conjunction. They are not, right? Like when we say John and Mary, we cannot drop the conjunct word from, word from there. However, it is likely to, it is possible to drop this word from here. We can say John knows, well not in this sentence, but in some sentences we can drop this that. Und understand that? So, therefore, it is not really, really a uh, conjunct, conjunct word alone. And then uh, conjunct word weighs two parts equally. These are not two equal parts of the same sentence. What is it? Before we answer that, uh, answer this question, there is one more, one more thing uh, which I want to ask you. you. This is not the first time you, are, you hear this word that. Do you know that there are two, at least two types of that in English? Tell me the, what is the literal meaning of this that? So, it, it does not have a meaning. That is just a pointer. But if I say, give me that, give me that book, do we have a meaning of that? That? Some noun, give me that. That can be anything. Right? So, that is a demonstrative pronoun. Okay? One of the, one of that is a demonstrative pronoun which has a meaning. This one does not have a meaning of its own. There are two types of that in English, at least. Okay? If, if we look at this part S2, it is clearly more than IP. Right? It is more than IP. And IP is a, is a simple sentence like the first one, John loves Mary or Bill loves Mary or something. A very pretty simple sentence. That John loves Mary is not just an IP is something, something more than an IP. What, what I want to introduce to you with the help of this is something called a phrase, complementizer phrase, which is CP. And this is, you, you understand the structure of the phrase? So the head of this CP is going to be C, which stands for complementizer. complementizer and then you get an IP. IP has its own subject so the way it works is this is where we have that will present And 
then we say Bill loves Mary. Now, what, what I wanted to change here is going to depend on your answer. In the main sentence where we have the predicate no, does this predicate no subcategorize for an IP or for a CP? That is, the S2 that you see in this sentence, is it an IP or a CP? CP. So, this verb, when we say it subcategorizes for another sentence or it could subcategorize for another sentence as its complement, what we actually mean is this is a CP. Okay? This is a CP. This is how in simple example a complex sentence works. Now, you need to combine the two structures together and that will be one x bar representation of the sentence to John knows that Bill loves Mary. Get this? In order to understand x bar, you need to look at just not just but couple of things very carefully. First, endocentricity of phrases. Second, components of a phrase in terms of the fact that every sentence, every phrase will have similar structure. That is an a specifier, it will have a head and it will have a complement. The intermediate category that is not the terminal one n or v and not the phrasal one n p or v p, but the intermediate ones n bar or, or, or a v bar is going to work as recursiveness, is going to provide recursiveness in the structure. Once you know these things and then what you need to keep in mind is categorical selection rules. Once you figure out what is the complement of the predicate and once and when you know that the subject is outside the predicate which becomes the specifier of the sentence, then the structure of the sentence, structure of the predicate and the complement structure, the, the complement placement all of them become clear to you and you can come up with a, with a, with a structure. We are doing it the, we, we are doing it the other way around. The main idea, the main reason why these things were proposed and studied was the claim is this is how generative mechanism of sentence production works in human mind when we learn a language, when we acquire a language for the first time, when we say we can speak infinitely long sentences. How does a gen, how does generative mechanism allow an infinitely long sentence. How do we know that a sentence is ungrammatical? Where does, where, where do things go wrong in the sentence? This, this, this is the way to capture such predictions in sentences. Clear? I, I have to talk about one more type of sentence and then I move on. But do we have any question about the two types of sentences we have seen? Simple sentence and this type of a complex sentence where we have a complex predicate in terms that the predicate takes a heavier complement which is a CP, not just an NP. Clear? Now, if that is so, I uh, uh, need to make some more space or I will leave it for some more time. We have a sentence, the third one, who likes Mary? This is a question sentence, right? Uh, in this, okay, let, let me put it this way. In this sentence, the word who is not really part of an IP. 
okay, it is not really part of an IP because it is not the subject of the sentence. It is a question word which questions the subject, not a question, not its subject itself. Do you, do you see this part? This, this word is not a question, not a subject by itself, which will be become little bit clearer when you look at the second sentence. What did John eat? What does this question word question in this sentence? What did the, what did this word question? What did the word what questions in the last sentence? This is this a difficult question to answer? The object. It it what is something that is part of predicate. Technically speaking, it's an object, and this sentence, last sentence, already has its own subject, which is John. Right? It's a language internal restriction. That is, it's part of the parameters of universal grammar that English questions always get fronted unlike other languages. The way question works in other languages is not in all the languages question words are fronted. That is, they occur in the beginning of the sentence. It is a language internal restriction in English that all the question words are going to occur in the beginning of a sentence. That is, all the questions irrespective of which component is being questioned gets fronted. How does it work in, a, in our languages? Do they really get fronted or not? How do we say the sentence? Uh, what did John eat? In let us say, many of you know Hindi. How do we say the sentence in Hindi? What did John eat? John kya khaya? John ne kya khaya, right? Is this word kya, which is a question word I am, I, I am assuming that you know, is this occurring in the beginning of the sentence? No. <coughs> Please know that question formation is part of universal principles. That is, all the languages of the world will have a mechanism <coughs> to form questions. How is parametric? In some languages, question words will come in the beginning of the sentence, in others, they will not. Okay? And both a set of principles and set of parameters form universal grammar. So, coming back to this sentence, in the last one you see that what is not really a subject. With the help of these two sentences, we can conclude that question words are really not part of IP. They are not within inflectional phrase. They are somewhere else. If they are what, what we need to know is where do they really go? Where do they really go to? That is, that is where, where it, they go to, to the complementizer phase. So, the purpose of positing a CP is not just to discuss complex structure alone. And again, I want you to know this in, in very clear terms that when we are talking about something like innate principle, something like universal grammar, which is part of innate principle of natural language, if one component of grammar explains just one thing, then that is too heavy a process for human mind. Mechanism should be explaining rules. For example, I uh, will delete it right away. You know this mechanism in mathematics. Does it explain just one thing? That is, what, what I am saying is, if I just put these two things here, this simplest possible mechanism of mathematics does not work only for adding 2 and 2. What this really works for is anything that you put on the, on the two sides of this, you are going to get a sum of that here. This is called underlying rule. This is one single instance of this underlying rule. 
what I what I am trying to say is if a rule like this gives you just one, explains you just one phenomenon, then that is too heavy an operation for, for something like human mind to operate. What human mind likes is something like generative mechanism, which should be able to explain anything as long as we are talking about sentences. So, the structure of an IP is going to take care of any sentence whatsoever. You come up with any type of sentence and once you know how to split these things, then you can fit, not, not just fit on purpose, that you know how the sentence works. So, it is X bar system inside generative mechanism is something like this rule. You can make this rule as complex as you can. I do not know mathematics that well, therefore, I am not giving you many rules. The, the, the problem of learning system, I, I need to come back to something. The problem of learning system is we learn this, but we do not know the, we do not learn the underlying rules. I, I can give you my example. I still do not understand the application of this, this thing, okay, because I was never explained this thing. I, I, I know how to compose and decompose and all those things, but I do not know how and why should I, why should I learn it? What do I do with this? At least this much was easy to figure out that when you go to the market, you need to do some of the things. This I did not figure out. Uh, that is that, my limitation. All I am, what, what I am trying to say here for our purpose is this mechanism is like the underlying rules. It is not just one, explaining just one single instance, clear? Therefore, if we posit something like CP and if it just helps us explain a subordinate clause, then that is not a very economical process. I, I think I have mentioned sometimes to you in the first few weeks that languages like to follow principle of economy. And this is one example of principle of economy that so, same structure should be able to explain other phenomena as well. Now, CP helps us explain question sentences in the following sense and it helps us understand one more aspect of it, which I just want you to know. See, a simple structure, a simple sentence is sentence like this is the, the structure of CP is such that the complementizer, the, the IP, the main sentence becomes the complement of C. And then we have IP, where we have a subject, we have an inflection and then VP. VP has its own, I am trying to make it, put it in short because there is no specifier of VP here. Uh, uh, there, there is a huge debate about these things, which is not really relevant right now. Now, let us come back to this. So, we have a sentence like, uh, what is the sentence that we have? Who likes Mary? Uh, so, here is the verb like, we have a present tense and then we have Now, the question is this I, this subject N p has been questioned, right. So, this is an empty place in this sentence and there is a role of empty places as well in the sense that we cannot say this sentence does not have a subject, it is just empty, it has been questioned, okay. So, this what happens actually is this N p moves out of this. And then it needs to land somewhere. It needs to stay in the entire structure. And then what happens is it moves to the specifier position of this CP. Then we say, who likes Mary? Now, there is one more, in, in, one more language internal rule in English, which says, when we make a question, what moves is not just the question word 
not the element which has been questioned. What, what moves is also tense. Okay. So, this I, this tense moves to another. Okay. Now, this may not be making much sense to you right now, but it will make more sense when I am talking about the second sentence that you see on this screen. So, isn't that clearly the complementarity phrase? There is a complementarity phrase, which is in, in simple term more than an IP. What we are saying is question sentences are more than an IP. IP is a normal sentence. We do not want to say these are abnormal sentences, but these are more than an IP. So, all interrogative sentences? All interrogative sentences are sequence. Yes. So, who is not a complementary? Who is not a complementary? Specifier. It goes in the specifier position. It re just requires a place to land. Now, remember who is an NP? Right? It is a phrasal category it is in the specifier position of the sentence. The place where it can land can only be in a specifier position of another phrase. Again, what we see a system in place, an NP which is not, which is a phrasal category cannot move to a complementizer position. It has to move to another position which can host an NP. When this thing moves out of its own original place, what is this? The category of this is an is a head. This is in the, the tense is in the head position of this IP. So, a head needs to move to another head position. C happens to be one such available head position in this structure. It moves there and then it explains the whole sentence how interrogative sentences work. So, so, we have to do the arrows as per how the… We are? We have to do the arrows as per how the x bar is drawn. R O? The arrows. Arrows, yes, yes. That is how. To explain uh, in interrogative sentences. And this is called, this phenomena when we are doing the arrow, this is called movement or displacement. These are examples of actual displacements of elements from one position to the other position. In, in earlier terms, in earlier grammars, this was called transformation rules. How we transform a declarative sentences into an interrogative sentence, okay? which is uh, the two sentences, one is declarative, the other is interrogative. We know that this interrogative sentence has been formed out of a declarative sentence. The later development of X bar theory and developments in generative linguistics, which we know as generative mechanism, help us understand that actually there is no transformation. We do not have a new sentence. What we have is elements within the sentence have been displaced. And this is an actual physical demonstration of displacements of elements in a sentence. Now, please look at sentence number 4, that is last sentence on the screen, and then you will see what I mean by the displacement of tense. When we, when the tense moves out of this thing, when a question, uh, when subjects are questioned, we do not visibly see the displacement of tense, but when objects are questioned, we see the displacement of tense as well. Can we say what John ate? Is that a good sentence of English? What John ate? What is a good sentence of English is what you see here. The sentence is, what did John eat? Right? What did John eat? Now, ate the, okay, let me use this space. The word ate is actually eat plus past, right? which we get to see as the way this exists, it sounds little bit too much to separate them into two.
but sometimes actually human mental computation works on this and separates this element out of this. Therefore, you see the sentence like this. You have a sentence, John ate an apple and then you, then you get, when you have a question, what did John eat? What we are actually doing is, while questioning the object, the, because of the language internal requirements of English, we also need to displace tense, not the verb, not the predicate, not the predicate. We need to displace tense alone, only tense, verb stays in its original position. We only separate out verb, separate tense out of the verb and then that moves. This is a physical real example of displacement and separation of tense from the predicate in uh, English question words. Can I, can I use the same, same structure to discuss the, for the, the last, last sentence here? You see, uh, I will need to delete some of the things from here. This is how it works. We have the tense here past. Right? And we have an NP, which is an object, is questioned. Okay? So what happens is in this case, this NP moves to the spec position. And we get Okay. What also happens is verb stays here and its tense moves to this position. And then we get, because this is past tense, what comes here is this. Now, tense is an invisible category. It does not have its own manifestation, which you can see with the example of this verb, eight. If, if I just gave you the word eight and asked you to show me past tense, you won't be, it, it's not possible to see the tense when it is associated with the verb. We really get to see that when we dissociate it from them. As an invisible category, as an inflexional category, the tense cannot stand on its own. Therefore, it needs the help of a, a, a fictitious element like do, which does not mean anything of its own in this case. Okay? And then do becomes an example of a present tense and did becomes an example of past tense in the sense that do hosts present tense and did hosts past tense and then they come here. Okay? When this is separated out of the verb, then the, what we are left with is a bare verb Therefore, even in the past tense, we say, what did John eat? Get it? Now, I, I want you to understand one more underlying fact out of this CP, out of this structure, which is the following. I am assuming that it is clear, it is clear, clear to you that question sentences are more than IP. Question sentences require in or involve actual physical displacement of elements from their original places to some other place, at least in English. Now, the reason why I mention this at least in English is this has been predicted or this has been uh, the structure for all the languages. In a language like Hindi, when you do not see things moving, there are more things to be, dis to be discussed, uh, which is uh, people posit that at, at a logical form level, at a deep structure level, they move, but at surface structure level, they show up in the right places. They, they, those, those involve complicated com computation. We, we do not want to, to go there. In order to understand the phenomenon of X bar, what we need to know is there is an involvement of actual displacement of elements, which the theory of X bar clearly demonstrates. 
the different categories, different phrases of phrases, which is part of x bar, x bar theory, help us understand several types of sentences. And finally, I want to draw your attention here that when we said the head is the head is the inflection is the head of the a sentence, what we mean is there is an association between this tense and verb. This association is not inherent. They, they get together, which is which becomes evident that they, at times they can be separated from one another too. If they were inseparable, then we will not be able to do this. And probably in those, if they were not separable, probably to say something like John, what, ate, what John ate would have been perfectly all right a sentence in English. The fact that we, John, what did John, what John ate is not a good sentence of English tells us that it is possible to separate tense out of verb. Therefore, sentence, tenses must be out of the verb to begin with in the logical representation of sentences. If tenses need to be out of the verb, then th there, are, there are more things that have gone into this. this. What, was this what was posited the, is actually the head of the sentence is this inflectional complex and then everything else is built around this. Is this making sense? There is one more type of question which I have not put here some of the yes no type questions right which is let's say if we have a question like is this a pencil i am assuming that you should be able to do it that in a yes no type questions in english in a in a language like english we do not have content word who what when in that case what the, what happens is nothing goes to a specifier position of cp what only moves is tense from the head to another head, which remains the, in, which keeps the integrity of question sentences that all the question sentences are CPs. We still need a place for tense to land, which and that place is the head position of a CP. Get it? So, in, in yes no questions, the only thing that moves is tense. Now, think about one more situation. When it comes to the movement of elements, what is more fundamental? Which element is more fundamental to move? That is, which element must move? Tense. Therefore, inflectional categories are of prime importance in the construction of a sentence. They determine the nature and structure of a sentence. Get it? Uh, and thus, both the types of sentences structure wise, uh, both the types of questions, uh, WH questions, which are also called content questions and yes no questions in which we do not have a WH word, both are CPs and both require physical displacement of inflectional elements and lexical elements. Lexical elements are the categories like subjects, like, like NPs in subject position or object position or it, there could be more positions. And we can question any NP or any PP, all of them will move to, to the spec position of CP. The reason why we are calling a questions CP, no not the reason, one of the reasons why we call them CP is this helps us predict that we cannot question two elements in the same sentence. We cannot say who, what, eight, there, because there are no two spec positions in the CP. Okay? So, the, the, these are not, to conclude, uh, these are not just artificial designs, these are not just fancy stuff to see. Uh, how fancifully 
we work around different elements of sentences. They have serious theoretical predictions of how language really gets projected in human mind. Now, for someone to believe this thing or not believe, it is like religion. Uh, what we do with this, whether this has any application or not, I, I, I personally believe the applicational stuff of linguistics to machine learning and computer applications is too far away from this, this place. We are still working with sounds. We are still trying to understand sounds and how machines should be able to understand sounds. Sentences and then displacement of elements in sentences and their semantic correlations are too far away. Which is not to say that things are not working in computer science. We, we, have, we have moved to, move, move, we, we have made a landmark pro progress and we see the products around us uh, with, with such thing. But to come back to what I am discussing, we may not be able to see the direct application of these things on how to design an intelligent machine. But once these things get modeled prop properly with proper algorithm in whichever way they are done, I do not know how to, how to uh, model these things with algorithms, but then you see the application of these things in other, do other domains. At least so far, these things help us understand in categorical terms about several new things about functioning of human mind. How human mind follows simplicity? principle of economy and projection of sentences. It is pretty clear through generative, un, through understanding of generative mechanism of sentence production. We, I, I had a couple of other things to discuss with you, uh, which, them, which is thematic relations. I, uh, I know we have to, uh, by we I mean uh, Professor Chaudhary needs to come, uh, come in for his, his, his classes. But I need two, two to three more uh, classes here uh, to, to wind up it in a, wind up things in a particular way so that we can say we have a fairly good understanding of two, three components of syntax, how they, they work. So tomorrow I work with thematic relations and, uh, and uh, C command. Okay. <coughs>